Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby. With me is the fabulous composer of Bros, Mark Shaman. Um, Mark, it's so nice to have you here. The because one of the special things about this movie uh, is that you have such a history with classic romantic comedies. Uh, when Harry Met Sally, Sleepless in Seattle, but Bros is the first gay romance uh, in this genre from a major studio. So, did you sort of ever look at your own past work as a as a mold to fill because there are such classics in the genre yeah well i mean i i don't know if you heard like when i read about bros in the trades i read about it and i know billy eichner and i know judd apatow just enough to have their emails i don't know them real well but i've you know been around them in this anyway i wrote them and said a, a gay rom-com i mean i'm the king of rom-com and I'm gayer than a goose. It, who else are you going to hire for this? And luckily, they agreed right away. So uh, that was really nice. It was like the easiest job interview I ever had. And pretty much the only job interview I ever had where I actually got the job. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. And then in the movies, like, there's one spot where he's watching You've Got Mail, which was the movie Nora Ephron made after mm -hmm. Sleepless in Seattle. And... I'm just going to say out loud that like the music from that movie very much echoes the music from Sleepless in Seattle. Mm. So it's funny, you know, with temp scores, you can tell what was in a movie, what they tempted with. So I could hear that they tempted that movie with Sleepless in Seattle. So it was easy in that cue to kind of summon up that feeling. Uh, otherwise, you know, you just look at the movie that's in front of you, regardless of what you've done in the past and, you know, that that may get you in the door or whatever, but suddenly you're just dealing with the movie in front of you, the director in front of you, the producer, you know. And... Right. And for that movie, I should say, Billy is so involved in this and wore multiple hats. And there is a really great original song, Love Is Not Love, uh, which you also helped write with him. Could you, it's so funny, uh, but also touching at the same time. What what was the process like of of creating that with him? Luckily, I was in New York because all of a sudden one day they said, uh, can you come to the set? We're in New Jersey. I was like, uh, luckily I could. And so I jumped in the car, got lost, of course, because uh, I'm so bad at GPS. As soon as I hear something on the radio that takes my uh, interest, I'm suddenly thinking about, oh, that's interesting. That's the A-sharp diminished chord over it. And then I've missed the turn. <laughs> so that's a big memory from that day was I once again got lost. And uh, Billy had the night before decided that his speech at the end of the scene should be something bigger, a, a, a larger event for him to show his love to Aaron. And what better way than to sing a country and western kind of song, which is something that Billy's character would never have done until he met Aaron and wants to show Aaron, I, I, I can change. So Billy came in with, well, 10 minutes worth of song. Part of my job in, in co-writing the song with him was figuring out how to, okay, let's take this and let's do that. But, you know, that, that can be some other song some other day. Uh, he had so many ideas. And then, that you know, luckily we were able to rent a piano right away, which we put into a trailer. And in between scenes, Billy came in. And in that one day, between me waiting for him to finish a scene and come back by the end of the day we had the song written uh which was still too long and uh the morning of the filming we still worked with billy on trying to trim it down <laughs> and we did and then what end, ended up in the movie is still a trimmed down version of what we wrote but th that's just typical of what happens in movies uh yeah. I should you, let you ask another question. No, it's you were on set. I half okay. expected to see you there as the the accompanist because you have a habit of making cameos. Well, you know, they have me off to the side, but the the characters in the movie were the ones playing for him. So I know <laughs> I didn't get my. I did have a cameo. They oh. did. They, me and Harvey Firestein had a scene. There is a hysterical moment that got completely cut out of the movie where at the Pride Parade in Provincetown, it breaks out into what they call a Pride fight 
literally fisticuffs, people, drag queens, you know, <laughs> strangling uh, families with kids. I mean, it was just hysterical. And the pride fight. And me and Harvey were just on the sidelines going, oh, remember the pride fight of 1982? Yeah, that was <laughs> a great pride. But they cut us because they cut the entire sequence. Well, hopefully there's a deleted scene reel coming yeah, for, so. yeah. for streaming releases. Um, I, I'm also, I'm always curious with, uh, when I listen to scores uh, and talk to composers like you, the process of figuring out what instrument is going to play what uh, melody here, because it, it has a very, the score to this movie has a very kind of like easy, relaxed quality. It's very gentle in places and... Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. We yeah. have it right here. How do you uh, do you hear that in your head? Uh, what What's amazing is that, is that there is not a piano right here. I just. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, you watch the movie. And I've always said, uh, like, I'm an I'm an accompanist at heart. That's how I really started in show business as, a, as an accompanist. And I love to do that. Like with Bette Midler, all these millions of years. I love that as much as writing a song to me it's all one big thing writing a song writing music writing lyrics writing a movie score orchestrating it's all the glory of music and lyrics and show business and mm -hmm. uh i'm so uh to me the movie is like a singer or another way to put it the, the movie is like a ballet that that they are they've already danced and now you're putting the music in after they've danced and you just have to figure out you know, or like if it's Bette Midler singing, but it's a movie, you figure out what is the perfect chord to summon up an emotion. But but always kind of knowing your place and, and letting the movie be the lead singer or the ballerina and, and knowing not to you know, pour yourself onto it too much and just lay back and just give enough. Mm. That's important. I, you know, we just had Halloween season. I was watching a bunch of horror movies and there was one where they start all the spooky sting music way before any scare is coming. I thought, why? Sure. I guess a scare is coming. How do you yeah. kind of walk that line of not telegraphing too much of the story before you before you should? That's the gig. I mean, that's the job and that's part of what makes a person be, you know, good at, at scoring a movie is knowing when to stop. And also you've got a director. And in this case, we had Billy, who was a co-producer and a co-writer. He was intimately involved with the creation of the score. And believe me, they'll tell you, you know, <laughs> that that's going too far. That's telegraphing something. Uh, we'd rather sneak in to that moment. You know, th those kind of discussions are part of the daily, you know, that's just part of the day-to-day the -day job yeah and musical theater is such an obvious huge portion of your life so do you <laughs> i didn't know i was going to get a free concert today it's amazing um do you think like skills there translate directly to when you have to score a film like the your focus on character in a musical yeah it's it's a little apples and oranges but it's all still fruit <laughs> um uh <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, a musical is very different. It's much more, it's almost the opposite of what I just said. Mm. A movie score, you've got to sit on what you might, you know, unless you get those big grand moments in a movie, you know, where you can, you know, really let it go. Uh, but in a musical, when a person has to sing in a musical, it's because their emotion is so big that it can't just be spoken. It has to be sung. Mm. So it's really kind of the opposite. And that's something why movie scoring for me, that's almost the hardest part of the job is to tamp. Is that the right word? Tamp down mm -hmm. uh, my instincts to want to fully <laughs> go full <laughs> out. I mean, and, and it was bizarre because when I was scoring the movie, writing the score, we were workshopping the new musical I have on Broadway right now of Some Like It Hot that's in previews right now. Right. But we were doing a workshop and luckily the workshop was in a building that has a recording studio two floors below. So I rented a room in the recording studio and I would go and be at the workshop rehearsal for Some Like It Hot 
And then when I saw I wasn't needed, I'd run downstairs and I'd spend a few hours scoring the movie. Then I'd get a text saying they need you upstairs and I'd run upstairs. So I was like going back and forth between these two different dynamics you've, you've described. Uh, so it was really uh, dizzying. It and also now, seems... Oh, sorry. No, no, no. And now they're both out there in the world, both projects. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't wait to see some like it hot. Um, it seems too, when I think of the work that must go into a film score versus musical theater, that perhaps is it accurate to say when you are scoring a film, it's a bit more solitary, like you're not working with lyricists and book writers. Um, so kind of what what would be the the joy you find? What is it that draws you to to scoring a film in that process? That's a good question because it is very solitary and I so much enjoy working on a show where like Scott and I write the lyrics together and that's like for me writing the lyrics with Scott is my favorite part of it really almost. I mean that's it's the most difficult part so I enjoy that the craft of it and then, then you, they, there you are in a movie in, in a room by yourself. I mean I have always like a technical musical assistant with me who I, you know, say, now get out of the room, because when you're composing, you feel naked. So I, I, I can't write in front of another person, a movie <laughs> score, I just can't. Um, yeah, it's solitary. Uh, but although not every movie ends with a f big orchestra, luckily the movies I work on usually do. And that is the most deliriously wonderful, profoundly, you know, moving part of the experience is to be in the room with the great musicians who were all brilliant musicians uh you know and to be in the room with like you know 30 40 50 60 of them you, it's just amazing to me that the ceiling doesn't just spin off from all that talent in the room all working together so that your music you know reaches its you know reaches its peak it's just that's the greatest experience. Also, as you can probably tell, uh, the orchestra is also, for me, like a, a forced audience. They can't go anywhere, so I can tell my stories and write jokes to them. So I enjoy that part of it as, just as much. <laughs> Does it have, I imagine, because you're in previews right now for Some Like It Hot, which I imagine is a, a period of a lot of change uh, and tweaking and trying things out. Um, is there a similar type of process with creating a score for film for you, or does it really just come out and the way it's no, going to live? I, no, I mean, on film, there's just those moments where you have the director and possibly the producer, in this case with Rose, come over. And in this case, it was all over Zoom, where suddenly you play what you've written. You have a few options. You know, we could do this or that. And, you know, hopefully they love what you've done. And even if they love what you've done, you still start making it bespoke even more. You tailor it. But there's, you know, opinions. And, and in the case of bros, there were big opinions. And, like, the first time I, I played stuff, uh, you know, Nick, the director, loved what I played. And then a few weeks later, I played it for him and Billy and, and other stuff I had built on that I had played for Nick. And Billy was like, meh. <laughs> so it's like back to the drawing board. Uh, so that's the only thing that's like a preview of a musical. I mean, a preview of a musical. You can't even imagine the, the teamwork that has to go into making any change. Uh, and we're in the middle of that right now. But Knockwood, where it's just tweaks. Right. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask, uh, kind of considering your your history there, you back in. 2003, I believe, at the Tony Awards, you and Scott shared a kiss on stage that like made a lot of waves. You mentioned at that time, gay marriage wasn't yet legal. What does it feel like now to have lived through these changes where we now have marriage, where maybe a kiss on stage isn't such a huge newsworthy thing? And now we have bros. You're, you've fully gone from, you know, those classic heterosexual romantic comedies to this one what does it feel like it felt wonderful i mean i i we're all human so we all can empathize with characters on screen whether they're gay straight or 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 anything i mean if a story is well told 
you find something about it that relates to your own life or you learn something new about a kind of life that you didn't know. Um, so I've never felt while working on heterosexual love stories, I never saw them that way. I just saw them as human beings. And same thing with bros. But having said that, yes, it was wonderful every day to work on a movie where there was such specific stuff that was so... I had never seen in a movie before. Not to mention, got to score a, a moment. I mean, there's a, for me, a very moving moment when Aaron is looking at the uh, display in the museum and and he, he's just all the faces of, of these gay heroes, many of whom I don't even know. And, it, and I felt like the character Aaron of like, I should know these people. I know a few of them. But what are the stories of all these other faces? And the fact that, you know, he... He leaves feeling like, you know, well, it's just it's just a wonderful scene, and, and getting the score it, uh, really touched me. Uh, um, you know, and then on the converse side, the fact that you know people didn't show up to see the movie as much as we would have liked, I have to admit there are many many reasons I know why, and I won't get into all that, but I will say that that Saturday morning, I did feel like a gut punch of like oh right oh yeah that's mm -hmm. right people don't want to hear about people like me and it was very disconcerting a very strange feeling and we're scared about tomorrow where we maybe find that out even tenfold about stuff much more important than a movie so right well was there any sort of you know before i let you go i want to maybe end on a, a, a nice note because I hope yeah. that I know in my I know in my circles everyone really loved bros and it was a huge you know dominated conversation for for weeks in in gay circles at least uh did you have any you know sort of positive feedback oh like my that? god did yeah you, were you aware of that oh, oh yeah I mean you know at the Toronto Film Festival it was clear that this movie was striking a chord and was so funny I mean, that's the thing that got kind of lost is the movie was just so fucking funny. And then it just got the discussion became just about like, you know, it's historic and it hasn't been seen. And and it started sounding like uh, homework. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we should always remember what Mary Poppins taught us you know, about a spoonful of sugar. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, oh, yeah, the responses that I got and Lord knows that Billy got were very fulfilling. I mean, from those who did see the movie, you know, what a great movie it turned into. I mean, it really, and they filmed so much. There's like a whole other movie that, that they could, you know, make. I mean, there's so many funny scenes. I can't believe they figured out how to shoot all that. And then and then smartly know how to say, no, we're not going to use that. We're not going to use that. I really admire that. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll keep my eyes out for the del many deleted scenes that are apparently out there. Um, Mark, thank you so much for joining me. It's been wonderful to have you. If you're out there watching, make sure you subscribe to Gold Derby. There's plenty more conversations like this one all throughout the season. <laughs> <laughs> and a score to send us out. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, thank you. Thank you.